So I want to talk to you about what has to be one of my favorite topics, and that is how to write automated tests. And you're going <clears> to <throat> you're going to laugh and say, you know, like, how can that be one of your favorite things to do? But having worked on a lot of software that ships to hundreds of millions of people, uh, especially working on code in Mozilla and Firefox, I learned that unless you can trust your code over time to be correct, it's very, very difficult to have confidence in shipping anything. So one of the things about being a student and you're learning to do projects for assignments is, you know, you got a due date and you got to finish this thing and you know, it's do it, it's do at midnight, 1159, you zip it up, you hand it in and you walk away and that's it. You're, you're not going to maintain this. It's, you know, you hand in whatever it is. Most of it works. Some of it works. Okay. The code is whatever. Uh, you're really proud of some parts of it. You're horrified by others. Typical software. The thing that you haven't had to deal with a lot, unless you've been out in co-op or you've done some work in industry, is you haven't had to maintain code for a long time. And you haven't had to update code and add new features. And you haven't had to make sure that when multiple people are working on the same piece of code, that one person doesn't break the code of another person. One person doesn't reintroduce a bug. One person doesn't make the code slower, doesn't make the code incorrect, etc. So how do you get around this problem? Well, one thing you could do is you could decide you're just going to be really careful about manually testing everything. You're going to sit down, you're going to have a checklist. Every time you do a release, you're going to go through and you're going to test this and test that. And lots of companies do that and lots of companies used to do that. But it's time consuming, it's laborious, it's easy, it's easy to get wrong because people are people and they take shortcuts and I don't know, it's hard to test everything all the time. So an alternative approach is for us to do automated testing. Automated testing is writing code that tests that your code works the way that you expect it to work. And there's all different types of automated tests. And I'm going to show you a couple of different types today. So what you need when you're going to do automated testing is you need some kind of a testing framework. Now, every language and every framework that you work with has some preference for the way that they do this. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples today. But we're, you know, we're doing code in Angular, and so Angular prefers this framework called Jasmine. So I'm going to show you how to write tests in Jasmine. And you're also going to see people talk about Mocha, and it is another really good testing framework used for testing things in the browser and on, on Node. And you're also going to see people talk about Jest. Jest is Facebook's testing framework and it's heavily used with React. But the thing about these frameworks is you can use all of them for anything. So I have worked with all of them. I really like all of them. And if I show you, this is the graph of NPM trends based on installations. You can see that Jest is probably the most popular today. Like if you just look by installation, which doesn't mean anything because if the project you're working on uses Jasmine or uses Mocha or whatever, you have to be able to go back and forth. What's nice about these frameworks is that you can switch between them pretty easily. Like the concepts are fairly similar. And so I'm going to show you a couple of examples to make this work. So what we need is we need to have some sort of a tool that knows how to run our tests for us. We need to have a way to write a test that takes our takes code that we're writing and then runs these tests to make sure that it works. And, you know, let me show you a, a real simple example from uh, the Jest docs. So imagine that you have a function. And this function takes arguments A and B and it adds them together and returns the value really simple function. And so what you decide to do is you decide that you want to write a test so that you can be confident that this code works. So what you do is you create a new file 
And in this new file, what you do is you pull in your function from the other module and you are going to write a test. So a test is a special kind of function which has a string that describes what it does. And then it has a callback or it has a little piece of code where you are going to execute your function. So I'm gonna add one and two. And then I have this machinery to make sure that the answer that I get back is the answer that I expect. So I have, a, I have an assertion language that says, I expect that the result of running this code is going to be the number three. And that's it. I have a very simple test case and I want to make sure for all time into the future that this code never breaks. So that whenever I put these two pieces in that I'm gonna get back the results that I would expect. And Jest or Jasmine or Mocha, they all give you the machinery to do this. To run your tests, write your test descriptions, and then have some sort of an assertion or expectation of calling this should produce this. So that's the basic concept. So what I thought we could do is I'm gonna break this into two parts. In the first part, I'm gonna show you how we could write tests in Jest. And I'm gonna show you Jest today as well as Jasmine because if you're doing automated tests for React, which we've been doing React as well, then um, you're, gonna run, you're gonna tend to run into Jest. So I want you to see what it looks like. So we'll, we'll use Jest to write tests for our um, REST API, our node app that does the bridges. And then in the follow-up video, I will write Jasmine tests for a component that we build into our, uh, into our app. So we'll do it in two stages. Okay, so, so let's begin. Let's, let's start by writing some tests for our code. So what, what's involved in doing this? So step one when you're doing this is you have to install whatever test runner you're going to work with. So I'm going to be working with Jest. So I'm going to um, I'm going to hop into my Bridge API folder and I'm going to install and I'm going to save to my dev dependencies the Jest framework. So what it'll do is it will. I'll give it a second to download uh, half the internet and it will it will give me Jest and it will give me the associated library. So when I say it'll give me Jest, what I mean is it will create a command in node modules dot bin. So it'll make a command that I can run and be able to uh, execute this. I'm going to pause this so you don't have to wait and watch this happen. I'll be back in a second. Okay, that finished. That took a while. So it has installed uh, Jest. And just to show you what I mean, if I look into the node modules folder dot bin, you'll see that uh, inside here, where is it? I have Jest. Jest has been installed as this executable that's in there that I can, I can work with. Okay, so because Jest exists, it means that I could modify my package.json. You can see that Jest has been added to my dev dependencies. And just a note, I'm putting this in the dev dependencies because it's not required in order to run this code. So if I was shipping this server to Heroku or putting it up on AWS or wherever I was going to I was going to run this API server, I don't actually need Jest to be installed. And so you want to reduce as much as you can the dependencies that have to be installed for production. So those are your dependencies versus your dev dependencies, which are only needed to do development. So the unit tests are only needed if I'm running, uh, running tests. OK, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a new script called test. And what it's going to do is it's going to run Jest. So note, you don't have to say node modules dot bin slash Jest. This is automatically part of the path. So when I just say Jest, it's going to go looking. That's one of the places it will go looking for a thing called Jest inside the node modules. OK, so we have Jest there. So if I save this, I should be able to say npm test. And when I do that, you can see that it runs Jest. 
here and Jest is gonna go looking for my test files to run and it comes back and it says error, uh, no tests found. So it exited with uh, an error code because it can't find any tests. So this is good. We've got our test runner working, but we don't have a test yet. So what we need to do now is we need to fig we need to add a test. All right, so let's think about what we could test. We have we really have two pieces of code. We have our server, and our server has a bunch of routes for working with the bridge data. And we also have this underlying database module here. And the database module has a method for getting all the bridges, and it has a method for getting a bridge by its ID. So why don't we start with this DB module, okay? It's pretty simple, and we should be able to write tests for this without too much trouble. Okay, so there's a couple of ways that people do tests. Some, some people say that you should put the test file beside the source file, and you should use the same name, except you should add some special ending to it. So you have a suffix. So in the case of um, React and Jest, what I would do is I would make a new file called db.test.js. So you can see that I have the source code file and I have the test file right beside it. So what's nice about this approach is that when you are looking at a file in the tree, you can very quickly find the tests that go with it. In Jasmine, you're gonna see that we tend, to, instead of saying test, we call these things specs. So we have spec files, but it's the same concept. There's another school of thought which says you should put your source code in one directory and your tests in another directory. So you separate them out. So you have a test folder and a source folder and you essentially recreate the same hierarchy in both places. So if I wanna find the test that goes with a file, I would go to the test directory and I would look for it. And you can do it either way. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it this way just to get us started. Okay, so when you're gonna write tests, you have to say to yourself, what do I care about here? What matters? What has to work? What are my expectations of this code? Okay, so let's, let's start out with the most basic thing possible, which is I have a module and I expect that this module should have two methods. It should have an all and a by ID method. So those are that, that's really easy for us to be able to write this. Um, we could come in here and we could do the following. So we could say, I'm gonna write a test, right? And my test begins with a string that describes what's going on here. So let's say uh, db.all should be a function, okay? And what comes after that is a function which is the test that you want to run. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to test that my DB module works. So obviously that means I need my DB module. So I'm going to require in the DB module here. So I want you to notice what I'm not doing. I'm not pulling in my entire program. So I'm not currently excuse me, I'm not currently testing everything. I am testing a very small portion of my code. So I'm doing what we call a unit test. I'm taking a, a very limited view of my code and I'm making sure that it works in the way that I would expect it to work. All right, so what can we do? Inside here, I'm going to expect that the db.all function, db.all that it is defined, first of all. So I'm gonna say expect that db.all, I expect it to be defined, okay? It needs to be defined. Now, when you're getting started with Jest and um, you're, all of these different libraries, they have, um, let me get this window bigger for a second so I can show you. All of these have um, some sort of a object where that allows you to do assertions. So in, 
in jest we call it expect so we expect some value and then we can we can do all sorts of things with that value so we can we can write almost like it's almost like writing english sentences and you're saying i expect this thing so if i look in here to be defined i expect this to be defined like this right and so you can expect all sorts of things to be true you could expect things not to be defined or you could expect things to be true or to be false you could expect well let's let's look at another one so i expect it to be defined and actually let's just stop right there that's that's enough if i save this i could now run this test so over here i'm going to rerun my test So I want you to notice what I didn't do. I didn't configure anything in Jest. I didn't say to it, these are my tests. I just have a test that's been defined and it found it for me. So it found db.test.js and it has printed out my string and says db.all should be a function. It ran my test and here the test has passed. So let's do another piece of this. Let's expect not only is it defined, but let's expect that the type of db.all, um, let's expect it uh, to be a function. Save that and I'll rerun the tests. Now, now it's run this function, the function passed, but I want you to notice that you're going to get into this loop where you write a test, you run the test, you write the test, you run the test, you go over and over and over again. So I'm going to add another script to my project here. I want to be able to tell Jest not just to run once, but it's very common with these test runners. I want to, I want to tell it that I'd like it to watch my code. So as I'm writing my code, I want it to watch for changes and automatically rerun the tests so that now I can save this. If I were to do uh, npm run test colon watch, it's gonna run Jest with the watch flag. And the first time through, it's gonna run the tests and then it's just gonna sit there and it's gonna keep working. So now if I were to, um, let's break the test. So let's say, let's expect it to be a number you'll see that my test now fails. So it automatically reran the test. The test comes back and it gives me this syntax here. Now you're gonna see this a lot and you have to learn how to parse it. So what it says is the value that you received is this one that's in sort of orange or red here. And the value that you expected it to be is in yellow. So you can see that when this test ran, it expected to receive number and what it actually received was the string function. And you can see what test it's in, you can see what line it happened at. And so you come back to your test and you say, oh, I see the type of db.all is expected to be a function. When I save that, it reruns the test and the test now passes. Okay, so let's do another test. Let's do a test for db.byid. This should also be a function. So this code is gonna be very similar. Expect db.byid. Expect it to be defined. And expect type of db.byid to be a function. So now I have two tests that are passing. Inside these tests, I have two expectations or two assertions that I'm running for each of the tests. So for this, for this test to pass, both of these expectations have to be met. And same thing for down here. Okay, so we're gonna write a whole bunch of tests here and I wanna talk about how to organize these. So what we can do is we can just keep writing tons and tons of these tests all together like this in this one file. But another thing that we can do is we can break them up into different sections. So what we can do is we can add a 
describe function at the bottom. So let's say I want to describe this is the DB module. And inside the DB module, I'm going to put all of the tests that relate to testing the DB module. Now, this isn't absolutely necessary, but it's, I'll show you what it's going to mean. When I save this and rerun this, you're going to see that my tests now look a little bit different. So I have my describe is here, DB module, and then I have each one of them indented inside that. So it allows me to sort of quickly look at the results. And when you start writing tests, you're going to have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of tests, and you're going to want to be able to look through them quickly and figure out what's going on without, because most of your tests won't fail that often. And when they do, you really want to pay attention to it. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I need to write a bunch of tests for the DB all and also a bunch of tests for the by ID. So I'm going to put another describe in here and I'm going to say that these are for, um, this is db.all. These are all the tests for db.all. So this one can go in here. And I'll do another one for db. Uh, by ID, just to organize things. Again, not strictly necessary, but I want to show you how these things, how they function. Okay, so now because I'm inside of this block, I'm going to get rid of the db.iid. I'm going to shorten it down. So if I were to save this now, you're going to see that I have my db module, and then inside db module, I have db all, and it should be a function, and db.iid should be a function. Okay, so let's write some more tests. So one of the things that you want to be careful of when you're writing these tests is you want to keep each test very small. How small? Well, you want to test one thing only when you write a test. So you're looking at a function or you're looking at a piece of code and you're saying, I want to test a very specific aspect of this. And then you say, well, the code that I'm testing, maybe it has 15 different aspects. Well, you're probably going to need 15 different tests, probably more than 15 different tests. So if we take a look at the db uh, all module here, what can we say about it? This is a function which is supposed to return an array. And the array, I would assume that the array is non-empty. So that's one thing that is true of it. I would also expect that the, the, the objects that are inside this array need to have an ID and a name property. So I can think of at least two things that I want to test about this. So let's, let's actually write that. So inside db.all, I'm going to I'm going to write another test and I'm going to say that in this test the the db.all function should return a non-empty array. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call my db.all function. So let's say result is equal to db.all. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to expect that result is an array. So the way you check if something is an array is you say array is array. So the is array uh, method that lives on the array constructor allows you to pass it an object and find out if it's an array. I'm going to expect that this should be true, like so. And I'm also going to expect that the resulting array's length should be greater than zero, like that. So these, ex these expects, and again, I'm going, I'm not gonna go through all of the different syntax of these things, but uh, greater than, to be greater than. There are methods on the expect, the object that gets returned by expect has lots of these methods that you can use um, you can expect things to be null. You can look inside of arrays. You can, it's really powerful. So when you're writing these tests, you'll spend time looking through all of the different options that you have in order to write your tests. And your, your tests are going to be like, call a function, check that something is true about this function, or make sure that it works in the way that, that you expect it to work. 
Okay, so let's see if that works. So over here in my code, if I save this file, as soon as I save the file, it's gonna rerun it. And you can see that I have an error. So it says two greater than is not a function. So that's just me, that's just a typo. To be greater than. So now it comes back and it that's true. So that those the expectations that we have of that function are true. Now you might be tempted to say, why don't we just put all of this inside here? Like, why don't we just write one giant test that has all of these different things? So what you're trying to do when you write these tests is you want to make it, you're trying to help yourself in the future. So in the future, if one of these tests fails because somebody changes the code, you want to be able to debug the smallest possible piece of logic in order to fix the test. So if I have a test which tests 5,000 things and the test fails, well, then I have to go through and understand all of those 5,000 things and one of them is breaking and it causes this problem. I don't want that here. I, what I want here is I want a small test, another small test, another small test. I want all of these tests to be as small as possible so that it's really easy to understand what needs to be true, what the assertions are for this, what's the scope of this test, and therefore be able to judge whether my code is doing the thing that it's meant to be doing. So you'll notice that in this case, I'm treating my function like a black box. I call the function and I look at the results and that's it. I don't care how the function is written. I don't care about anything inside the function or the implementation of the function. I'm just testing the interface of this function. So if you call this function, it should return back an array with items inside it. Okay, let's write another test. So I could say test, and let's say that it should return objects with um, ID and name properties. So I expect, <clears throat> excuse me, I expect to have name and ID properties on here. So step one, I'm gonna say const result equals db.all. Now, one of the things you're gonna find with these tests is you're gonna find that you're gonna end up writing a lot of the same code multiple times. And that's fine because each one of these tests, first of all, it's very important that you think about these tests as being 100% isolated from each other. So you never wanna do something in one test which is relied upon in another. So for example, you might be tempted to say, all right, well, these both do this. I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say, you know, Let's, let's just do this like that. So why is that a problem? It's not necessarily a problem, but it introduces a potential bug. And the bug is that if this test here in any way modifies the data that's inside of this array, then the next test is gonna get data which is not what it should have been. So you're gonna suddenly have a dependency between these tests. They're gonna be related in ways that you don't want them to be. So your testing frameworks usually give you a way around this kind of a problem. And so uh, let's have a look at how we do it in, um, in Jest. So in Jest, you have a function called before all, and you have another function called before each. So if you want, what you can do here is you can say, before all or before each, and both of these take a function. So there's one like that. Okay, so before all is gonna get called once before all tests are called. Before each is gonna get called um, before each test is run. So if you need a place to do some sort of setup where you wanna share some code, you could do that here. So what we could do is, let, let's just rewrite this. So I'm gonna say, um, let result here. And I'm gonna say before each test, I wanna run this code 
I'm only doing one thing, so I'm going to say I want to um, say result equals db.all. Okay, so I don't have to write my code this way, but what this allows me to do is inside here, I can work with result without having to recreate it. So you're going to see this, this technique used a lot when people have to set up a call to a database or you're going to see this when we do our testing in Jasmine with Angular where we have to create a component or you have some heavy set of initialization tasks that you need to do before each one of your tests gets written. So you can do that here. And you'll notice how I'm doing this inside of my describe. If I put this before each up here, it would do it. So it's going to be in the scope of whatever block you're in. So I only care about doing this inside of um, these tests here. Okay, so let's write this test. So let's think about this problem. Um, we expect all of our objects to have a, an ID and a name. So what could we do? We could, well, one thing we could do is we could go through and we could loop through all of the values that we get back. And we loop through all of these values and we get back an object, we take this object. So we could expect that this, the keys inside of this object look like this. So object.keys, when you run that, what it's gonna do, like, let me just show you here if I have, um, so if I have an object, uh, let O equals um, ID five name, uh, name Seneca, like that. If I say object.keys O, what it does is it gives you back an array of the keys. If you said object dot values, it gives you back the values and you can also do uh, entries and it will give you back an array of each key value pair. So what this code over here says is get the, um, get the list of keys inside each one of these objects and it make sure it's equal to this array here. And Jest is going to is going to be doing some clever work for me to figure out whether these two arrays are equal to each other, which is great. So that's going to that that's going to make sure that we have an ID and a name property that go in each one. So we could save this and it'll run run that test and it's passing. Um, what else could we do? We could do a test here. We could say, you know what, we expect that not only are they there, but we expect them to be strings. So you could do something like expect that O, the type of O.ID, um, it should be a string and expect that the type of O.name should be a string. And that's working, so that's passing. So now we know a bunch of things are true about this function. We know that this is a function, we know that it returns a non-empty array, and we know that that array contains objects with, <clears throat> with ID and name properties, name strings, string properties. Okay, so we've got some tests here written for, for that function. Okay, so now let's go down and write some functions for by ID. So let's think about by ID, how does it work? By ID takes an ID and it looks inside of the bridges array and it is going to find a bridge whose ID is equal to this ID and then it's gonna return that bridge back again. And the bridges data, let's just grab some, um, let's grab some data here. So this is what one of the bridges looks like. Just for purposes of writing my test, I'm gonna stick this in this file so that we can uh, reference it. 
Okay, so we already have a test and it we know whether or not this thing is a function. So if if I call this thing with um various values for ID, I have certain expectations of what should happen. Okay, so let's think about this. So the first thing I can think of when you're when you're writing tests, you need to you need to become a bit of a pessimist. You need to think negatively uh, in order to uh, have your code work the way you want it to, which is to say, you need to think about the cases that could go wrong. So think about all the ways that this code could break. If I, if I said um, that this function, I, I basically want this to, um, I want this to, should return nothing if, um, if the ID is empty. So let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to expect that if you call db.byID with no ID, I expect that the result of that should be undefined. And I'm going to just write tests for um, a bunch of these, like if, if you don't put anything or if you put undefined or if you put null or if you send in the empty string, in all of these cases, I expect that the thing that I get back should be undefined. Okay, so that's great. It's, it's returning back to me something. It's not throwing an exception. It's not blowing up my program. So this is what I expect it to do. And if we expected our code to do something else, then we would change this contract. So your tests are a contract that you're writing and you're saying, um, your tests are a contract and, and you are, um, you're trying to make sure that they follow, that they follow what, what's supposed to happen. Okay, so let's let's do the opposite. Let's think positively. What if I passed in an ID that is there? Okay, so let's let's write a, another test. So if I, uh, I it should return the expected bridge object for a given ID. So let's let's use this one as an example. So if I said if I had an ID of uh, we'll just use this one because we know it's there. I have this ID and I'm going to say result equals db dot uh, by ID and I'm going to pass in the ID that I just I just got there. Okay, so now I can do a bunch of expects. So I can expect that the type of the result is going to be object. So I expect to get back an object. So I'm going to write that. I also expect that the results ID should be equal to the ID that I put in up here. So I'm going to request this ID and I expect to get back to get back that ID. So I'll save this and just see how that's doing first of all. Okay, so so far that's passing. Um, what else could I do? Well, I could expect all of the data to be exactly the way that, that it should. So I could say that I expect the result, the name, to equal this name that we have up here. Let 
me just copy this. Okay, so the latitude should be this. Longitude should be this. The year should be 1899. The length should be 54. And the, the width should be null, like that. Save that. Comes back, everything works. Now, I want you to, I want you to look at this test for a second with me and think about how we could improve it. So one of the things that's gonna happen to you when you're writing these tests is you're going to be tempted to hard code certain assumptions into the test that are not part of the code. So if you look at this code, this is the code that we're testing right here. This code is completely separate from the data that it is operating on. So imagine that we're connected to a database, or in this case, we're connected to a JSON file. So what we have here is we have an external dependency that is part now part of our test. So if you look at this uh, test code, what we're really doing is we're testing the JSON file. We're testing to see whether this bridge exists inside of the data that comes back from the comes back from the database. And this is a dangerous thing to do because if any of this data ever changes, so if, for example, they widen the bridge or they enter the bridge width or they change the ID or they tear down this bridge and they remove it from the database, all of a sudden our test is gonna fail. Not because our code is wrong, but the test is gonna fail because the underlying dependency, the assumption that the test is relying on vis-a-vis -vis the data that we're testing against is gonna be wrong. So what I wanna do here is I wanna, I wanna change this around. So I'm gonna call this test uh, version one because I, this is not the way that I wanna write this test. So what do we know to be true? When you're writing these tests, we know up here that we have a function called dbAll and dbAll returns a non-empty array. We know that to be true or if it's not true, this test will fail. And we know that the db.all function returns an array of objects that have an ID. So instead of hard coding information about this bridge, we could use that piece of code to help us. So let's do this. Let's write version two of this and let's change this. Let's change this around. So what I'm gonna do is instead of hard coding in this bridge name, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a sample bridge from calling db.all. db.all returns an array. I'm gonna grab the first item from the results. Okay, and now what I can do is I can say const, uh, well, let's do this. Let's, let's, instead of hard coding in that bridge name, I'm gonna say, sample.id. So I know that this thing returns back an object that has an ID. I'm gonna pass this ID into my result. So now I'm gonna expect that the result.id should be equal to the sample ID, like that. I'm gonna expect that the name is equal to the sample.name. So I don't actually know what the name is and I don't know what the ID is. I just know that it has those properties. So I pull one out of the results and now I'm gonna use it here when I'm doing this. Now all of these need to change. I don't actually know what, uh, I don't actually know what the values are gonna be and I don't care to be honest with you. So let's rewrite this slightly differently. So let's say that 
I expect that the type of result.lat, I expect it to be a number. And I can do that for all of these, all of these. So I could say I expect the type of the result, the type of the result. like so. Now length and width are a little bit different because they are optional values. So I need to do a check. Sometimes, like if you look at the data, sometimes it's null. So we can have some of them where the either the length or the width could be null in some of these cases. So I have to I have to write my code defensively. So I'm going to say if the result Dot length. If it if it exists, if it's if it's truthy, then I'm going to expect the type of that result to be a number like that. And if it's not, then I'm going to expect it to be null. So I have two ways that this could work, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'll do the same thing for width. And that passes, which is great. So I, I'll pause this here, I don't, I, I think I've written enough tests, but I want you to notice something. So we're almost to 95 lines of code for our tests. We have like, if I got rid of the comments here, we have about 10 lines of code in our implementation and almost a hundred. So we have an order of magnitude more testing code than we do with our implementation code. And this is really common. So it's really common for a project to have way more testing code than implementation code. The implementation is pretty easy, but what we're doing here is we're making sure that the code operates the way that we expect it to operate so that we don't have, uh, we don't have, you know, we don't have any bugs in our code, or we at least understand that the ways that we expect it to work are the, you know, are in fact the ways that it does work. So just to clean this up, I'm going to get rid of this version of the test or I'm going to comment it out because um, I want to use I want to use the version that doesn't have I want to use the version that doesn't have um, the implicit binding to this uh, data that's in the database. I want the data to be, you know, whatever the data is, I want to use that data when I'm going through here. Okay, so this is a good place to pause. So I'm going to pause it here and I will, uh, when we come back and do the next video, I want to write tests using Jasmine instead of using Jest. And I want to do it inside of the Angular part of the code that we're working on. So instead of doing the Node API, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Actually, I think what I'm going to do as well is I'll show you how to write some tests for the REST API part. So I'll do both of those things.